Hi, and welcome to the Rothberg Catalyzer Prize, part of Startup Yale 2020. I'm going to hand it over to Cassie Tucker, Managing Director at Sci City, in just one second. Cassie, take it away. Thanks, Ab Abby. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the 2020 Rothberg Catalyzer Prize Pitch Off. This is the second live pitch event of Startup Yale this year, and we are thrilled to have you join us wherever you are in the world. Uh, Jonathan Rothberg, our generous donor of today's prize, initiated this competition at Yale three years ago with the goal of igniting young minds to solve the most pressing medical challenges. A big thank you to Jonathan for his support of the teams you'll be seeing today, as well as the, uh, the broader Yale student body community. In a moment, you'll be seeing four fantastic teams compete for the grand $15,000 prize awarded to the best student-led venture focused on developing an innovative hardware or AI solution to solve a medical challenge. Here today to help us select the winners, we have five fantastic judges. Margaret Cartiera, Investment and Innovation Director at the Yale Center for Biomedical Innovation and Te Technology in Yale New Haven Hospital Center for Health Innovation. Sharon Wally, Program Manager at the Health Venture Corporation. Alyssa Seifert Jarvie, Clinical Data Analyst for Foresight Capital, Shri Muthu, CEO and co founder of Health Ventures Corporations and Managing Director of Health Venture Labs, and Ellen Su, Chief Product Officer at Convexity Scientific. Each team will have 10 minutes to pitch their idea and answer questions from our judging panel. After all the teams have pitched, the judges will then deliberate to choose the grand prize winner. While the judges are deliberating, we ask you, the audience, to vote on who you think who you think has the best pitch today. We'll announce the grand prize winner as well as the audience choice winner online after the, the last pitch, roughly 15 to 20 minutes. So please stay tuned. The first team we will hear from today is tackling the fragmented healthcare system in Kenya by developing a searchable SaaS platform that aids the patient and the customer journey to find healthcare providers, share health records, maintain treatment plans, and compare prices. Team DM Health, please start your pitch. And thank you very much. Uh, we are really happy to be here and uh, we are really excited about this. and. Uh, we really hope that uh, you will be able to see the, the, what we are trying to build. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to the CMO, uh, William Otrayo, to take us through the problem as he sees it. experiencing a clash between <laughs> infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases. In fact, just to uh, give you a few statistics, more than 400,000 people currently die of malaria in Africa. More than 20 million patients actually have HIV uh, in Africa. And any child born in Africa is 15 times more likely to die than their counterparts uh, across the globe. And this is because of preventable uh, diseases like uh, lower respiratory tract infections and other things like malaria and uh, uh, including other things like uh, problems like pneumonia. Now, the other issues we're currently experiencing is that uh, non-communicable diseases are also in the right place in Africa. And this is just stretching the healthcare system uh, even more. Uh, a good example is uh, diseases like diabetes, hypertension, uh, respiratory diseases, uh, um, and, and other diseases too, so uh, like cancer. The problem is that three in every four people who have non-communicable diseases actually will die and these deaths will be found in Africa. And just to give you another a very uh, a gleam statistics is that more than, uh, 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 we are experiencing a rise of more than 146% uh, in terms of diabetes. And by 2045, we will have a very, very large number of uh, such diseases like non-communicable diseases. I also need to tell you that three in every five African 
uh, spends, uh, uh, spends uh, in their healthcare treatment uh, from out-of-pocket expenditures. And this makes healthcare uh, seeking even more challenging. I'll give you an example of Kenya, a country where we are currently coming from, uh, just to show you some of the challenges we face. Kenya currently has almost 15,000 healthcare professionals uh, with several national hospitals, private hospitals, and even county hospitals. And on top of this, we have so many private uh, medical clinics, almost 2,000 and uh, more than 5,800 pharmacies. Now, this is not a lot by uh, any measure, but it's just there to show you that already because of the healthcare system that is broken down, we are having more adaptation within the system where uh, many healthcare practitioners are trying to develop solutions uh, to solve some of this problem. And as much as we are trying to solve this problem, we are even seeing more problems emerging. And I'll just summarize them into three. One becomes inconvenience, as patients have to move from one area to another, actually looking for healthcare facilities where they can get care. But two is quality. Uh, these healthcare facilities are not located in the same places. They are located in different geographies. In some places, they're even uh, densely populated in other areas, and that re reduces access by patients to this area, creating a quality uh, challenge. On top of this, we're seeing an expense challenge. Uh, as I've already said before, more than 60% uh, of people in Africa actually spend uh, out of pocket to get their treatments. So if they have to move from one area to another, if they have to move from one hospital to one lab, to another specialist, then that uh, increases the amount of money they spend uh, quite significantly. In summary, we have a system that is completely fragmented, uh, presenting uh, challenges in quality, convenience, and uh, expense. Uh, sorry about sorry about the initial glitch. Um, well, so as a uh, as, as William has said, uh, we have a really fragmented system. And so essentially what we are looking to build is a software as a service marketplace that will facilitate practitioners and patients to interact right from discovery to credentials, to uh, verification of licenses and record management, to billing up to the discrete delivery of medications to the patient's footsteps, I mean doorsteps. Um, more, more importantly for the patient is that they will be able to own their information and th this will allow them to shop easily and also to switch uh, practitioners easily, thus lowering the costs. For practitioners, uh, the automation will allow them to uh, get rid of the mundane uh, administrative tasks and concentrate on uh, patient care. Uh, to reduce costs, we plan to uh, use a AI fast in the low risk areas of uh, customer care and uh, post care follow up and such. And then as we build data uh, by growing our, our customer base and growing our data points, uh, we will be able to actually expand this to uh, AI aided uh, trials as well as uh, specialist selection. So it, it will be able to at least uh, prompt you in the right direction if you're looking for a specialist and you're not quite sure what specialist you want to pick. Now, to concentrate on our core services, we will integrate uh, the system with uh, a platform for uh, payment services, as well as last mile delivery services and insurers. By offering a coordinating function, we will not compete with the practitioners, but we'll instead uh, offer the practitioners um, an opportunity to actually compete with the bigger institutions such as hospitals. Um, now, I'll hand over again to William to Take it through our strategy. Strategy is basically based on some personal experiences I had as a physician. So just to put that into perspective before I give you a, a good uh, indicator of what we're planning to do. I once treated a patient who had hypertension and this patient had been uh, through so many doctors and had spent so much money to the point they were losing hope. The unfortunate bit is that I, I found out that the patient had more complications because of this neglected care, and now they had, uh, uh, were having renal uh, insufficiency and uh, kidney failure. So as a good doctor, one thing I had to do was quickly refer this patient to a specialist, and to my utter surprise, the patient completely refused to do that, saying that they were not going to spend any more time looking for more healthcare physicians or even trying to get better healthcare. If I was not going to treat they are simply were not going to go anywhere else to get more treatment. And that just points out to our strategy of what we intend to do. 
So uh, from June 2020 this year, we expect to start in Africa. And uh, we are uh, specifically going to focus on Kenya. And we are going to focus on two disease area entities where we think there's high urgency to seek care. And also there's going to be a high uh, chance of uh, ensuring patients adhere to their treatment. And these are men's health and women's health. And to be more specific, we're going to focus on erectile dysfunction or prostate hi uh, hyperplasia in men. And also in women, we're going to focus on some common disease area like uh, the PP discharge, which uh, have a high urgency to seek uh, treatment. Our first uh, few years are going to focus on customer care specialists who are going to uh, build trust with the patients to enable them to use our system more effectively, as well as to help us capture data, which is going to train uh, our system even better. And so in the first few years, uh, our main task is going to be customer acquisition. Moving on into March, we expect to introduce new diseases. We will have learned a lot from our uh, uh, offering to a niche uh, type of patient group and have learned uh, what to do best, how to adapt our system to give the patient a better health experience, but also to give the doctors confidence to use our system. You can see uh, that in the second cycle, we expect to have a few in-house general practitioners. Um, and this is mainly to focus on uh, working side by side with our AI technology to ensure that we get the maximum learning we can get, as well as to try and uh, start passing down some of these uh, repetitive administrative roles and diagnostic roles to our AI system. At that point in time, then we will be having a chief technology officer come in to join our team to help us uh, better consolidate uh, technology and the human aspect of control. As we move on into December 2022, uh, you are noticing that we are starting to uh, get a lot more countries. And this belt here actually accounts for a third of uh, the African population. And so we'll be having more regional teams and consolidating our treatment of diseases. Thank you. And, and so the question is, why now? And the reason we think uh, this is important right now is because right now we are uh, experiencing um, a new development such as the African Free Trade Agreement, which is going to be uh, to open up uh, the doors to be able to expand regionally without custom tariffs um, and, uh, and any other uh, costs. Uh, there's also the increase in internet access as Google uh, brings in uh, Project Loon, which has already been uh, launched in Kenya. And this is uh, going to provide free internet for the citizens of Kenya. Now, our projections show our focus on um, just growing the company very fast within the first three years so that we can accumulate as much data as possible to be able to uh, develop the AI systems. And so um, we, are, we are looking at a customer acquisition cost of around uh, $6, but this in future will provide like $21 in um, customer value. Now, the opportunity is not without um, competitors, uh, but all the competitors in the in the in the current in the current landscape uh, miss integral parts um, of the of the customer uh, service uh, journey, and so uh, there is always gaps within uh, what they provide. And so, what we are trying to provide is a seamless experience, as well as be able to collect all the data throughout the system, uh, so that we are able to. Um, develop uh, this customer, you know, customer care AI and eventually the referral AI. And uh, our progress so far uh, from ideation, uh, we've been able to do research and we've been able to uh, create a website uh, to collect um, uh, customer information and see their willingness to actually adapt this uh, kind of uh, technology. And within two weeks, we managed to actually get um, around 27 uh, customers uh, converting from uh, 400 hits. And so we believe there's a clear uh, need for this. Uh, we also had interviews with healthcare practitioners and uh, pharmacists who, are, who were able to give us a clue into the competitive landscape and why they would be willing to uh, move to such a platform. Now, in conclusion, we believe that we are the best team to actually uh, proceed with this solution. Um, I am an MBA student um, with seven years experience in financial advisory and private equity. And uh, Dr. William Otreo is a Masters of Advanced Management student at Yale as well, uh, with seven years experience in, in the medicine field, as well as uh, 
pharmaceutical field. And so we hope that you will uh, be able to uh, look at this very broadly and uh, join us uh, as we try to uh, meet this urgent need. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, DM Health, for kicking us off. That was, that was great. It's always hard to be the first pitch, so thank you. Uh, let's turn to our judging panel and start with the questions. Sharon, do you have any questions for DM Health? Yeah, um, so first of all, you know, thank you both for presenting and taking the time. Um, I think one of the questions that I want to ask immediately, and I was switching between our rubric sheet and watching the pitch, so maybe I missed it, but um, how do you guys plan to use um, the $15,000 that, you know, this prize offers? Um, what's your, what's, what's that, what's that next six months going to look like or how much runway is that going to give you? Thank you. So, um, with, so fortunately, um, well, you know, really fortunately it was planned. So I, I essentially um, have been, uh, uh, you know, developing my, my uh, programming skills. And so, for the first one year, we won't need a chief technology officer as I'll be able to handle the basic uh, programming. And so what we essentially use the 15,000 for is customer acquisition, aggressive customer acquisition. So we reach our first year target. Um, and then, we, you know, a, a small stipend for, for myself as well, so because I will be working on this uh, full time. But this will also be complemented by um, other pledges uh, that I got. Uh, I started working on this, uh, the summer and uh, managed to actually uh, get somebody interested in it and they offered to um, to give a, an amount of 40,000 to this. Okay, um, that's exciting to hear. And just as a small follow-up, sorry to take time for other judges, a small follow-up, um, what, what, where are you planning, um, I'm originally from Kenya so I'm a little familiar with the landscape, so um, where are you planning in terms of like your customer acquisition plan um, for the platform and how you're going to be engaging um, the country or the people and the different stakeholders that you've discussed? Sure. So um, our, our target customers are essentially, you know, tech-savvy Kenyans, right? And so um, our initial, uh, uh, our, our, our tests that we, we carried out uh, between December and January are actually targeted people uh, using adverti ad advertisements and advertisements uh, specifically for um, you know, urology and, uh, you know, ED related matters. And so uh, that's a strategy we, we want, we plan to use uh, going forward. Um, in addition to that, we, we intend to use our peer referrals. So instead of paying uh, $6 uh, for, for, you know, an, um, an, an advertisement, well, it's not really $6, it's cheaper, but the, the, uh, the, the conversion rate makes it uh, $6 per, per person. But uh, essentially, instead of paying that, We'd rather pay somebody uh, four dollars of credit into their account if they manage to uh, refer somebody who successfully uh, joins their account. I mean the the platform and uses the platform. In addition to what you has said, uh, maybe just to uh, summarize again, is that uh, my experience in healthcare has led me to have a lot of relationships within the healthcare system. And this has just been exemplified with my, uh, again, experience working in pharma. So we have a lot of peer uh, relationships with other healthcare practitioners like urologists who have a lot of these patients coming to their clinics and would love a uh, good follow-up with uh, a system like ours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's move to our next judge, Ellen. Do you have any questions for DM Health? Ellen, we're having a little hard to, we are we're not hearing you. Oh, Say that again. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Um, so I, I noticed that you only had two of the team members and you mentioned that you won't need to bring on a CTO right away. But when you are thinking about expanding the team, who are the next couple of key hires that you're looking at? And uh, will, the, will the amount of fundraising that you're doing be able to support that? Sure. So the immediate next... Uh, Team members that we'll be looking at is uh, hiring uh, customer care uh, specialists um, who have some experience in uh, the medical uh, field. And so uh, we already have a CMO who has a lot of experience in that and uh, we, you know, I'll, I'll be doing the programming. And so we'll need a couple of people uh, in, in the customer care side. Um, and these ones in Ken based on Kenyan scale, scale, uh, salary scales, they won't cost much. Um, 
we will be able to comfortably uh, uh, pay with uh, around twenty thousand dollars. That that's you know that's in addition to uh, you know fifteen thousand in addition to uh, what what I, I had already gotten as pledges. Okay, great, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Shri, would you like to ask a question to DM Health? I, I would. Thank you. Um, good presentation. I like the thesis that you have. Um, I'm concerned about um, how are you going to uh, distribute your product in a market that um, has already existing competitors? I just wanted to hear better about what is your plan for that? Uh, sorry, so just to make sure I got the last part of your question, you're saying uh, in a market that already has uh, distinct competitors? Correct. Great. Um, so again, um, the, the competitors who are there have not gotten uh, much traction, um, or rather the, the direct competitors who are there have not gotten a lot of traction because of the gaps we identified. They're not really full service, right? And uh, we intend to uh, appeal with our full, you know, uh, no gap service that uh, we, you know, once you get into the system and uh, we're able to uh, process you to, uh, uh, from one particular to another, uh, you won't have any breakage of service, uh, including up to, up to, up, up to uh, delivery of uh, medication. And so we, we believe ours will be very appealing uh, to any customer. And uh, we haven't seen also uh, some elements of what we are trying to uh, introduce because we haven't seen something like a discrete delivery. We haven't seen something like a information uh, retention by the patient. And so we believe these elements, uh, if I have, if somebody offers me to be able to keep all my history so that next time I'm, I move with it to somebody else, I believe that's a key selling point which nobody is actually uh, uh, addressing. Thank you. So if I understand that correctly, Cassie, do I have time to expand on that question? Yes, you can. Thank you. Um, so if I understand the question, you're going to basically add features to make this an end-to-end -end experience for the customer across the entire life cycle. And you're also going to make it so there's some value add functionalities that makes it so that they're going to keep coming back to the product. So that's great. So that's a build it and they will come model, right? But I think the question I'm asking a little bit more pointedly is, that's great, but how are you going to get the market to adopt your product? What is your distribution plan at this point? What's your advantage in distributing the product? Sure. Um, so um, our, our initial model is, uh, again, to uh, target uh, uh, first the, the areas which we believe uh, people have been struggling with, uh, such as, uh, you know, um, I, 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 researching it, I, I found it's called the shame economy, um, where, where people are a bit uh, apprehensive to go to uh, healthcare services, right? And so uh, by generally just reaching out to them and providing information uh, that, you know, you can actually get this addressed uh, by things such as such engine optimization, so, so that when somebody is searching for something like, how do I get uh, a solution for my erectile dysfunction? How, how what, um, you know, you know, something like uh, I don't last long. I know that's funny, but <laughs> I don't last long. But immediately somebody such as something like that, uh, we are able to uh, come to the top of the, the list. And uh, this should be able to uh, get us our initial um, uh, customers uh, on board. And uh, again, from that, we'll be able to use creative means such as uh, peer to peer referrals and such to grow. I don't know if I've addressed your question or I'm missing something. I'd like to no, I think that you, you're telling me that your beachhead market is sort of urology and things that are, people are hesitant to go see a physician or a clinician in person for, and you're going to start with that, kind of like what Roman is doing in the U.S. So exactly. strategy, and you have to put some money aside for clearly SEO and marketing. So thank you for exactly. that answer to the question. Appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, judges, and thank you, DM Health. Let's welcome our next team, Therma Band. Thermaband has developed a smart, wearable device that empowers individuals struggling with controlling their body temperature to achieve thermal relief. Team Thermaband, please start your pitch. Great. All right. 
Hi everyone, I'm Marquia Dickinson and I'm a first year, I'm a second year SOM student and I'd love to introduce um, Thermaband. So how many of you have felt cooler or warmer in a room than you'd like? Whether you're in the airplane, movies, home or your office, well one in every two people feel a personal inferno that rages within in the form of a hot flash or night sweats at a certain phase in their life. Ultimately, you know what temperature is ideal for you, your body, your zone. We envision a world where temperature is a personal and private matter. Thermal relief is accessible to all and menopause is a celebrated milestone in a woman's life. Our mission is to empower women to control their thermal health in a natural and safe way. So why are we the team to bring this solution to life? Our team and advisors reflect the skill sets and experience needed to do so. Our founder, Debbie, is a benefits attorney and former Wharton lecturer. I, as I mentioned, am an SOM student and co-founder and bring consumer goods and operations um, and manufacturing expertise. And Derek is also an SOM student and our lead engineer who brings experience from Apple. Given how integrated the university is, we've also been able to leverage groups of students, groups of undergrad students across disciplines in order to research various aspects for the device. We've been so fortunate to work with advisors spanning several industries. Here are a few, and perhaps most notably is Dr. Mary Minkin, who is a nationally known menopausal expert. So what exactly is the problem we're seeking to address? To illustrate the need for this solution, I'd love to, I'd love for our founder to share her story. Meet Debbie. Thanks, Marquia. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thermaband was inspired by my own lived experience. As a perimenopausal woman, I know firsthand how excruciatingly uncomfortable thermal discomfort is, yet there is no standard of care for relief. Instead, physicians lack viable solutions that are organic and celebrates menopause and natural evolution of life, and instead offer invasive hormonal treatments or no remedy at all. Other common solutions on the market include wearable, stationary or portable fans, wearing a frozen eye pack or ice pack, sorry, or placing a cold pack on the neck. Uh, I found these and other solutions bulky and undesirable. After connecting with many of my contemporaries in blogs on women's health, I realized that I was not alone. Many women simply suffer in silence. So this slide demonstrates the state of our desperation for thermal relief. So the core problem we're addressing is that women need a natural, safe, and effective solution for thermal relief in managing menopause. Here are some of the striking statistics that we found that demonstrate the need for an alternative. A recent Yale University study showed that of all the women who seek medical attention for menopause, nearly three quarters of them are actually left untreated. The reality is that 1.1 billion women are projected to reach menopause by the year 2025, and 80, and 93% and of menopausal women seek non-invasive technical solutions, according to a recent AARP study. So the reality is that menopause doesn't only lead to just discomfort and inconvenience. Uh, research from the NIH shows that it also impacts quality of life, productivity, and even economic outcomes. Thermaband is a movement to disrupt the thermal health market as we know it, your body, your zone. Our device is a smart wearable with automated heating and cooling activation. So how does it work? The wrist pulse points have several major blood vessels and nerves. So through activating the device, your brain triggers a response so you actually feel more comfortable. Several research institutions have published research and commercialized technology as well. We see this as a huge market opportunity, evident by other companies actively targeting it. Um, it's also referred to as the billion dollar race to invent a wearable air conditioner. So we've leveraged a holistic approach to provide thermal comfort. Through combining material science, physiology, and data science, um, we've been able to do so. The thermal sensors, as I mentioned, monitor and regulate the skin temperature intelligently, adjusting to your personal needs. 
By utilizing localized heating and cooling, we're able to change your perception of how you feel, providing a very similar feeling to a hot cup of coffee or even ice on your wrist. The data provided through the app will be able to provide digital health data for the user. Through our product development journey, our team of designers have leveraged a very user-centric approach as we're constantly getting more and more feedback on what women want to wear. We finalized our prototype through testing and iterating with a team of early, early adopters who are passionate about our product as we are. We're looking forward to the next step in our product development journey to begin the production validation product process. In terms of how we're different and of course better than our competition, we are discreet, affordable, and a versatile solution in terms of offering both heating and cooling. And what's interesting here is the criteria that we used in order, the criteria that we use in order to assess our device versus others that are on the market um, is actually through consumer focus groups and over 200 survey respondents from women that have ranked the most important features for this solution. In fact, 80% of our respondents said that automated thermal comfort is extremely critical, and 90% said that a discrete design is equally as important. In terms of pricing, we've leveraged feedback from surveys as well. Our, we're, our plan is to offer two different models, a base model and a plus model. The plus model will have additional physiological and biometric sensors. Our premium data plan will include access to these insights and trends. So our marketing approach is community driven as many of our early adopters haven't been connected to a menopausal support community and actually thought that they were alone in the hot flash, in the hot flash battle. We focus on building relationships with women across various channels. Our founder, Debbie, has become an active member of several menopausal organizations to connect with women. Several of them are actual, actually listed, listed here on this slide. And we plan to leverage the power of word of mouth marketing in order to, um, in order to socialize the idea amongst different groups of women. And we've already started working with Red Hot Mamas, which is the largest menopausal community in the United States. Our plan is to sell primarily online and we'll expand to various retailers and QVC as well. So our marketing plan will likely lead to expanded marketing opportunities as women have a very wide sphere of influence in their circles. Women, research shows that women are the primary caregivers in their homes, they're the primary healthcare decision makers oftentimes, and also 80% of women are the primary consumer product purchasers in their homes as well. So this slide shows where we've been, where we are now, and where we're going. Underlying all these milestones is the speed to market, the speed in bringing this to market, especially since this is a daily reality that my mother and so many others are facing. In terms of intellectual property, we're working with an experienced patent attorney to protect elements of our brand, technology, design, and software. So the reality is that the Rothberg Award would propel us in gaining early market demand through a Kickstarter campaign. We have our prototype, we have a multi-layered approach for our intellectual property and have already raised our family and friends around. And we're looking forward to bringing this to market and really gaining early market demand through the Kickstarter campaign. So as part of bringing this to market, in terms of scalability, our total addressable market is 3.5 billion people globally. Thermaban has enormous potential and there are four main verticals that we plan to target within thermal wellness. Our bottoms up market sizing approach um, has proved that this number is 3.5 billion and outside of women that have menopausal symptoms will provide relief to people that have both internal and external sensitivities to temperature as well as occupational heat stress. So this device will provide menopausal women and others who are suffering with thermal discomfort and much needed relief. These photos provide just a small window into some of the use cases that we've identified through research and several interviews. Um, the top two photos show um, the fact that 
some of the major use cases are both prostate and breast cancer survivors, um, especially with chemo-induced menopause um, or chemo-induced hot flashes with um, patients. Um, first line responders, we've spoken with several nurses, um, obviously extremely timely now with COVID, um, who feel uncomfortably warm in their PPE and would love this sort of solution to feel some comfort. We've also spoken with seniors that have temperature sensitivity and would welcome this solution. So we're excited to bring this product to market and bring thermal wellness to all. Join the movement. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Thermoband. Uh, let's turn to the judges for questions. Alyssa, will you kick us off? Do you have questions for a Thermoband? Sure. That was a great pitch and obviously a huge unmet need. And it's clear that you've thought about a number of different customer segments. I have a few technical questions. Um, do you know how fast you need to change someone's body temperature for them to get relief and what kind of power that would take to go from changing the temperature on someone's wrist to affecting their systemic body temperature? Yes, so we, it helps quite a bit because there's a lot of research that's been done in the space over the past two years. And in terms of functionality, we've been able to leverage our competitor's device. Um, as I mentioned here, the Ember is the competitor that we've been able to leverage in order to understand research that they have published, research that the University of California, San Diego has published. Um, and, they, and they actually detail exactly how much time it takes and, and actually the body temperature effects as well as the perception um, that people have. Um, and that, that research has all been available online. So we have dug into that quite a bit to understand what we would need in our device to make sure that we have the power to do that. And do you see any intellectual property problems by leveraging what they've published? Are they pursuing anything at UCSD or does Ember have any patent protection that you're worried about? Um, Ember, Ember does have, does have um, a patent relative to their design and the technology that they've used. The underlying technology that provides the heating and cooling sensation has been on the market since the 1800s. It's the Peltier, Peltier model. So, uh, so, so that the, the good thing is that the, un, you know, the underlying functionality relative, relative to heating and cooling is, is fairly common. Uh, so we something different in terms of our technology and really working with um, a group of engineers and our uh, patent attorneys to, to really distinguish ourselves in, in, that, in that field. And one more legal question, since you do have a, an attorney on your team. Do you, how do you foresee the risks of burns or cooling too much? Um, yes, the efficacy uh, of, of the, uh, the thermal regulation here, uh, it, it's, it's fairly proven. The, the same technology is really being used in car seats. So the same technology that heats and cools the car seats uh, and a number, a number of uh, other uh, consumer products that, that we use on a daily basis. It's also being used to cool the International Space Station, um, so used by NASA in that, in that effect. So, um, and, and to piggyback a little bit on, on Marquia's uh, prior answer uh, relative to the, you know, the battery capability does not require much power in order to do what it is that we need to do. Um, and, and how we got to this and the need for this and, and the, um, the, the relief that uh, simple heating and cooling provides with like at home experimentation, putting a cool glass of, of water on this putting a, a warm cup of coffee on my wrist. And, and just that uh, sensitivity, which we can all kind of picture and, and imagine, was able to, to, to be very effective. So it does not require much heat, and uh, the technology is, is fairly standard. OK, thank you. That yeah. answers my questions. And just a quick build on that, we're actually working with engineers to, to, to integrate technology in the device that would ensure that it doesn't go over a certain over a certain temperature and under a certain temperature because we have we have heard the safety concern from doctors in terms of hypothermia risk and things of that nature. So we are working to have those um, foolproof um, things in the device. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Ellen, would you like to ask the next question? Um, yeah, I've got two questions. So first one, um, I I'm wondering about uh, using it for occupational heat stress since 
uh, it doesn't get rid of the underlying problem, which is uh, that the environment is is too hot. So do you, is there a concern about, you know, the cooling just taking away some of the symptoms and potentially um, causing problems with uh, just masking underlying issues and putting people in that environment for too long? Yes, and, and um, we, we will be very clear with our customers and early adopters relative to what, what this does and what this does not do. So in, in an extreme environment, extreme cold or an extreme hot, this, this is not the solution. This is really a situation where you're uh, warm or cool in, in uh, you know, let's say you're in a movie theater or you're at home, it's, it's cooler than you'd like, warmer than, than you'd like. Multiple people in the same room, there's no one thermostat setting that, that is optimal for everyone. So if someone feels the room feels great to one person and a little cool to another, the Thermaband will help that person, um, you know, have, have a, uh, be a little warmer, perceive it to be a little warmer than, than it actually is. But, but we're, we'll be very clear that this is not uh, applicable in extreme temperatures. Uh, you know, you can't go outside in freezing cold weather with a Thermaband and, and expect to be comfortable and not have hyperthermia. So we'll be very clear relative to its limitations. Awesome. Um, and then the second question, uh, where do you see the cost of goods for this at scale for your, for your device? Yeah, so we actually have a financial snapshot slide. So several numbers here, but we have worked, um, we, we have someone on our team that has finance expertise as well. And we've kind of worked through understanding some of the average costs. We've worked with engineers to understand um, what some of the bill of materials looks like from a production standpoint. And um, we've, we've come up with these numbers for the next five years. So overall averaging around 70% of our revenue is what we're projecting within the first year, launching next year for a cost of goods sold. And then this kind of shows the, the track throughout. But that's based on a high level analysis with engineers who have given us data from um, assessing the, the, the components. Okay, so to break that down a little bit, so you're you're targeting a hundred and ninety nine dollar sale price um, for the basic device. So what proportion of that is just the cost of materials for you? The cost of materials for that is about fifty percent. And I think okay. that gives that gives some more rationale for why we're planning to have multiple revenue sources. So the one is that obviously the hardware, but the software, the data subscription model, that's been, that's been mentioned by several women as a, as a need that they have. So our plan is to, this cost of goods sold kind of gives some more insight into both those revenue streams, but um, we're still looking into how we can get that cost down. Okay, sounds good. Great, thank you. Margaret, we'd like to hear from you. Do you have questions from, for Team Thermaband? I do. Would you be able um, to go back to your timeline slide and clarify um, key milestones and how they relate to your financing. So whether it's the fifteen thousand uh, dollar potential award or additional pre-seed or seed financing, and how um, that relates also to your hiring um, key people onto the team. Absolutely. So I'll start, and then Debbie, you can you can chime in with some things. So so far, I mean, the first step, as I mentioned, let me start backing up a little bit. As I mentioned, we have moved extremely quickly from starting with the inception of the, the idea in Q3 of last year. Um, so from that time, we just, I mean, our, our strategy really has been to bootstrap throughout. So that's kind of been our funding approach. We identified the need, we followed the Gates route in terms of trying to identify ways that we can become the standard of care. Um, our, in, that was in Q3. Q4 was really coming up with our um, MVP testing. In order to fund that, we actually raised, um, as I mentioned, 50K with friends and family round. And that allowed us to start building our prototype, which we work with our designer to be able to do, and as well as an engineering team. Um, and also quite a bit of that was also used towards um, patent filing. So con conducting a full patent search, as well as filing provisional patents. Um, that was kind of some of the major breakdowns for the, um, the pre-seed round that we, that we raised. The 15K um, Rothberg Award, as I mentioned, would be really, really pivotal as we know that there's quite a bit of up upfront costs that are needed for the Kickstarter campaign. And that would allow us to gain early market demand, gain traction um, amongst our, as we're using a community-based approach, really 
to make sure that we have women engaged and really loving the product and, and willing to support us throughout the journey. Um, and our next stage or our next kind of phase of development is to begin the production or the design to manufacture in the production process. And that's when our plan is to start our angel round in Q3 of this year. Thank you. Great, and I think that's all we have time for questions. Uh, so again, thank you judges and well done Thermaband. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have a control trial. Powered by AI and natural language processing, control trial accelerates the patient screening process for clinical trials by automated scanning of clinical trial protocols, patients electronic medical records, genomics, and real world data. Team Control Trial, please start your pitch. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Guanan. To facilitate a smooth virtual pitch today, I'm representing the Control Trial team to present you how we can help resolve this big but challenging problem, clinical trial patient recruitment. With Control Trial, weeks and months become hours. Millions of dollars will be saved. Let me tell you more. For any disease such as diabetes, cancer, or COVID-19, to make sure all new treatments are safe and effective for patients who use them, treatment needs to go through rigorous research studies with human volunteers, and that is clinical trial. Most clinical trials have four phases, and patient recruitment is essential across all stages. In the US, $7 billion was spent on clinical trial each year on average, and 40%, which is $2.8 billion, was spent on patient recruitment. However, clinical trials fail because of many reasons. One of the key reasons is not being able to recruit enough patients. In fact, 50% trial delay due to recruit patient recruitment. This delay might cause potential loss as high as $8 million per day. Control trial is here to solve the patient recruitment problem. To understand the problem, we have complete over 60 interviews with different stakeholders, including pharmaceutical company who are the sponsors contract research organization who help facilitate recruitment, and hospital who conduct the trials. We interview different roles in the hospital, doctors, nurses, IT managers, research coordinators, and also in different specialty areas, such as cardiology, pediatric, internal medicine, and oncology. We found that the current patient screening process is not efficient. As Dr. Taylor, director of clinical research in pediatric department said, and still take a lot of manual work. Also, Dr. Foster, oncologist and hematologist states, the research coordinator plays the key role in the workflow to connect patients to clinical trial. And real-time analytics is important for best patient matching. Let's talk a little bit more about the pain point. This is a typical workflow, how clinical trials are conducted. On the left, sponsor uh, contact research healthcare organization to recruit patients for the clinical trial. Then the primary investigator asks coordinator to screen qualified patients to enroll the trial. Next, coordinator will try to match patients and connect them through their caring team. Currently, research centers are investing to improve the efficiency of coordinator's work. They use tools such as patient portal and reporting workbench from the electronic health record, EHR system, such as EPIC, to filter patients on very basic criteria. Usually it takes several months to write the query and start the search. Then coordinator need to open each match patient's chart and manually review to confirm the eligibility. Still not efficient. I know this because I work in EPIC for over six years and I lead the clinical trial patient recruitment tool development. I know there are a lot of work need to be done and that's why we are disrupting here. You can see that coordinator is central to the process and is the gatekeeper. That's why we'll help them first. Resolve this bottleneck will further benefit everybody in the workflow. Control trial software analyze clinical trial eligibility data and real-time patient data. Patient data includes structured data such as demographic information, diagnosis code, and unstructured clinical data includes such as doctor notes, nursing notes, past allergy report, and other important medical data in a free text form that cannot be searched easily. The software uses AI and natural language processing 
to extract tens of thousands new clinical data points, symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, genomics, social determinant data, and more. Turning fragmented medical document into a unified patient graph that contains all the information needed to match complex clinical trial criteria. The software does not only improve the efficiency, but also the accuracy of patient matching. Our software stays within the healthcare organization's network. It will be HIPAA compliance protecting the patient information. And this access to our software will be controlled by IRB review for particular clinical trials. Try to imagine, with control trials help, after submitting the trial eligibility to the system, coordinators don't need to wait weeks to months to start matching patients. They could start in hours. They will get a most updated matching patient list every time they log into the system and they don't need to jump among different systems to do the manual review. They only need to verify the system highlight information and go ahead reaching out to the patient. Control trial software integrates seamlessly into current patient screening workflow with little overhead, analyzing real-time patient data and providing the most updated accurate match patient list. To prove the concept, we have created a working prototype using openly available data source, clinical trial protocol from the clinicaltrials.gov, and 35,000 de-identified ICU patient healthcare data from the MIMIC database. We firstly extract eligibility information from one ICU-related trial, then randomly select 100 patients from the MIMIC database to keep the manual review work as a manageable level. Next, in parallel, ask the coordinator to manually screen patients and use our system to automatically screen patient, then confirm. As a result, we have seen 500% increase in screening efficiency. Here's a demo screenshot of our prototype. After submitting the trial eligibility to the system, all matched patients will initially fall under the suggest bucket. After coordinator open the patient chart and confirm the highlight information, they can reach out to patient and move them to the next step of the recruiting process. This also demonstrates that our software can be easily integrated into the existing clinical trial management system. With the increase of the efficiency for a typical research healthcare organization with 20 coordinators conducting 40 to 60 clinical trials each year, we can expect to save more than 3,000 hours staff time, $400,000 to $600,000 in labor costs. The market opportunity is huge. A global market is 8.2 billion US dollar and the US market is 2.8 billion dollars. With our current pilot project with Yale Smile Cancer Center, we chose to start from oncology patient recruitment, which is around 584 million dollars per year in the US. We'll focus on certain therapeutic area. After tackling oncology, we can easily adapt our solution to other specialty areas, such as rare disease and to more sites. To scale up our business to more research healthcare organizations, we'll first provide consulting service to help them identify gaps in their current workflow. Next, we'll conduct pilot projects and provide our software service to integrate into their system. After establishing the partnership, we will develop new services to healthcare organizations together to sponsors, such as clinical trial design. With more sponsors on board, we will expand our service to their other sites. As an early startup, Control Trial received several recognitions in a very short time, including NSF i -Core program and from Thai City. We appreciate the support from Yale Center for Outcome Research and Evaluation and agreement for pilot project from Yale Smile Cancer Center. Now we have a working technology. We have lined up pilots. We are in a good position to ramp up operation and finish the pilot on schedule. And that's why we are seeking to win the Rossberg Catalyzer Prize to help us. Further, we target to get the first paying customer next year, expand to more specialty area, and scale up to most customers. We are a focused team with a great mixture of background, science, engineering, and business. And with tens of years experience in clinical research, healthcare, software development, we share the same faith and passion to solve this challenging problem. I'm Guanan. I work over 10 years in the healthcare IT industry, including Epic and startups. Now PhD student in the Department of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics. Wei Yu has many years experience in R&D, operations and VC. Now MBA candidate in School of Management. 
Fei Mei is a PhD candidate from the Department of Biomedical Engineering with experience in clinical research and biotechnology. Chris was one of our mentors from Yale's uh, FOM and now joining the team with over 35 years experience in the healthcare business. Also, we have lined up great advisors. Professor Krumholz is director of Yale's Cancer o Center of Outcome Research and Evaluation. Also serves as advisory board for several healthcare, pharma, and tech companies. Professor Schaus is director of Center of Computational Health and has great experience on large scale healthcare data analysis. Dr. Lee is Andrew Investor, physician executive for InterSystem and board member for MIT Hiking Medicine. They can guide us to do the pilots in the right way. Thank you for listening. Control trial, right patient, right trial, right now. Great, thank you so much, control trial. Uh, on to questions. Margaret, why don't you start? What questions do you have for control trial? Sure, uh, thank you, great presentation. Um, a question about data and privacy. Given the many regulatory and security concerns about accessing electronic health record data and that this would be an outside company, um, what measures will control trial be taking to ensure privacy and compliance? Thank you. Yeah, I can take this question. So uh, as I mentioned, so our system um, will be stayed within the healthcare organization network. So everything uh, we, we accept, every time we access the EHR system, I mean, that's under the ARB review. So with the agreement, we partner with the healthcare organization. So we are, we are uh, always uh, concerned and uh, the same, has the same concern and awareness that protecting the patient record. So uh, what, what's the standard that healthcare is taking now is the same standard for ours. So I think that's why we are positioned as the partnership with the healthcare organizations in the first place. So that's why we can work together to, to protect the information and have a guarantee that everything works in the right way. So just to follow up on that, so will any data leave the healthcare system and be um, exported into a database by clinical trial solutions and be used externally for other purposes? No, all the data stays within the healthcare network. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Shri, do you have any questions for control trial? Can you guys hear me now? Good. So um, you look like you have a lot of progress um, that you've thought through and you're doing this Milo cancer pilot and so forth, what will the, the additional um, funding that comes in, what are you planning to use it for like in the immediate short term? And I saw in your chat, I was kind of like trying to get lost there a second. Yeah, right so yeah. I'll take the question here. So since the purpose of the Rothberg Award is to really help us to uh, revamp, uh, accelerate the pilot program, so since now we already have a working prototype, but we really need someone during the summer to fully dedicate it to monitor the data processing and more or less to serve as a, a customer service to the to facilitate the pilot project other than Guanan, who's our technical expertise. And then meanwhile, we would also need to recruit a part-time uh, coordinator to sort of uh, do a controlled experiment to test uh, the pilots we using and without using control trial, what is the real efficacy among them? So that's two major uh, allocation of the founding for Rothberg Award. And the last part is some uh, legal expense, including to protect our trademark, uh, our domain and registration of the legal entity. And that's our uh, plan of expanding the Rothberg Award. And then the, the coordinator is for helping recruit folks or work with folks for the control experiment, what, what impact has any, has some of these school shutdowns have, have had for you, or hospital shutdowns have had on you? Well, uh, that's gonna cause us some delay. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, uh, you know, nowadays, all, uh, almost all of the clinical trial other than COVID-19 is suspended or, or delayed. And meanwhile, there's also great demand of uh, COVID-19 uh, trials. So that's part of our 
a backup plan in case all the other oncology related uh, clinical trial are suspended for now <coughs> and we'll see how that will go. So uh, on the top of that, also I think uh, due, to, due to the pilots, we have plans of, uh, which is doing the real time clinical trial, it takes time. I mean, right now, recruiting clinical trial, it takes time. So we have another plan to uh, doing some retrospective uh, clinical trial that's already finished. So that, time, that, that means that uh, we already have the data, but with using our system, we can still prove the efficacy and the efficiency for those data. So we have uh, some, um, some talk with, uh, with the partner at I mean, Smile Cancer Center. There's some recently just completed trial that we can, we're ready to, to jump on uh, and do that. And, and what's your confidence level of being able to pivot if you needed to at this point? Yes. Do you feel pretty confident that you can pivot if you need to because of the changes that are happening? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I, I think, like I said, I mean, doing the retrospective with all the data is already available that we can, we don't need uh, any, anything from, uh, try to ask for resource from the healthcare system that we can, we can do the work and we will hire a part-time um, coordinator, just help us to verify everything and uh, double check the, the results. So that's what we're gonna use the, the money for. It, it, Sri, I'd, I'd like to add on to that. The, the extension of there is some current interruption into normal workflow for it, but you know, here we are pitching virtually, right? Um, so we're an example of that. Um, but because uh, the impact of COVID-19 on clinical trials has, has really uh, put a hold on, on many trials, in the long term, there's gonna be a lot of pent up demand for sponsors to get their trials up and running quickly. And we'll be well positioned at, uh, in six to nine months when the new normal becomes new normal, right? Thank yeah. you, that's what I want to get a sense of. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, let's move on to Alyssa. Alyssa, do you have any questions for control trial? Sure. Great pitch and idea and um, excellent proof of concept data. I had a question about whether or not you're planning on staying with Epic or if you're going to build functionality to incorporate other um, electronic medical record systems. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. So as I said, that we, we, uh, right now we are focusing on uh, creating the partnership with healthcare organization. There are other, definitely other opportunities such as uh, to, uh, being partnership with the healthcare organizations such as, as Epic or InterSystem or other uh, healthcare IT companies that they are they are having the day. I mean the technology that missing our part. So we can be a great partnership. We can create a better solution for for the customers. So that's a, one opportunity. There's also another opportunity to work with the pharmaceutical company uh, or the CRO company. But we will stick with the, our current strategy because uh, of uh, our our uh, aim to to ha access the real time data and. Um, addressing the, the, the current uh, uh, target, I mean, pain point for the coordinator. So that's, uh, that's just our plan. And do you have a plan on how to prevent a competitor from coming in behind you and doing something very similar? Yes, definitely. I mean, um, so as I said, uh, oncology, it's a, it's a very competitive uh, I mean, area that everybody try to get in. But uh, we will focus on a more specific therapeutic area. So that way we can create a higher barrier for competition. And also we can reuse our model uh, to, to other, on other sites that's easily transportable and reusable. And Alyssa, on, on top of that, uh, one part of our fundamental value is we really cherish our partnership with hospital. Uh, I know there's a lot of a competitor in this space and a lot of competitors are trying to take advantage of the access to the hospital's uh, HR data uh, to uh, put on their own agenda for exploring those data. But in here, our key business model in our center is to really focus on helping the hospital protect their data and the data analytics and the storage will never leave the hospital. So I guess that's a fundamental value really differentiated ourselves from other competitors. Thank you. Yeah, and Alyssa, just to add on, besides um, Epic, we'll be happy to work within the uh, EHR systems for Cerner, All Scripts, and any others. Great, thank you. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Control Trial. Well, last but certainly not least, we have Team COVA-DX. COVA-DX is developing a fast and affordable diagno diagnosis tool for blood cellular morphological diseases. Team COVA-DX, please start your pitch. Ready when you are, Yao. Sure. Hi, I'm Yao. And I'm Tim. And together, we are COVA-DX. So as COVA-DX, we are combining 3D face imaging with deep learning to build a faster and more affordable diagnostic tool for blood morphological diseases. During my clinical practice as a physician in Ghana, I saw many patients who had blood morphological diseases, including sickle cell, GCSPD, and uh, blood cancers like leukemia. And I witnessed firsthand how these diseases dramatically worsened the quality of life of my patients. I myself am a career of the sickle cell trait, and I have a deep understanding of what it takes to live with these diseases. It's a cycle of hospital visits and pain. The problem with the current diagnostic methods is that they are time consuming, expensive, and require trained personnel. If you take malaria as a case in point, the microscopic diagnosis, which is the gold standard, can take up to an hour to get a result. And what is more worrying is the fact that the results depend entirely on the quality of the reagents used, the type of microscope used, and the experience of the lab personnel. And so this is why we built CoverDX to provide a faster and more affordable medical device for diagnosing these diseases. And even though we are currently in the prototyping stage, we are building a device on published and patented research. So I'll hand over to Tim to explain some more. Thanks, Yao. So as for how our device works, a healthcare personnel collects a sample of blood from the patient and then puts that sample into our patented cartridge. The cartridge is then inserted into our device to be imaged. That 3D image of the blood cells is then sent to our deep learning model, which both performs the classification to determine what type of disease the person has if they have a blood disease, as well as gets the health of the red blood cells. The results are then displayed on the screen of the device and are also sent to a secure health healthcare platform to be seen by the doctor and the patient at their convenience. So I'll go into a little bit more detail onto various parts of the system. So for the cartridge, our cartridge uses microfluidics to separate the blood into its various components. These components are the cells, the plasma, and the buffy coat. Because it's all done in the cartridge, there's no staining or extensive prep work required, and it's very quick and easy to use. As for our microscope, we're using a quantitative phase imaging microscope. Now, how quantitative phase imaging, or QPI, works is you have two beams of light. One, the sample beam, passes through the sample, or the red blood cells in this case, and then the other beam of light is the reference beam, which doesn't pass through the sample. Both go and then are collected on the detector on the other end of the microscope, and the difference between the two beams is computed, the phase difference, to get the thickness of the cells. So this gives you a 3D image or the morphology of the red blood cells. Now, most QPI microscopes, or pretty much all the ones except for ours, require using an air floated table to use because any small vibrations in the environment will mess with the, with the imaging. The patent that we have, however, doesn't require this. It uses a close to common path geometry to get the, um, with the reference beam, the sample beam going side by side so that if there are any vibrations, they happen together and the um, device still works without an air floated table. These air floated tables are expensive, are not very common in developing countries, are hard to come by in those places, but because of our system, it can be used on any table. Now, as for our AI, we're planning on using convolutional neural nets on the 3D images acquired from the, from the QPI, as well as a few other supervised learning algorithms. These include linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees, and for the three previously mentioned supervised learning algorithms, we're using features from the 3D images, such as the eccentricity, the volume, and the surface area of the cell. So I'll pass it over to Yao to talk about our starting point of sickle cell disease. Thank you, Tim. So if you listen carefully to Tim, you would quickly realize that our tool really can be applied to many diseases. At this stage, we decided to apply to sickle cell, not only because I'm a carrier and uh, as a physician who has treated patients with sickle cell, 
but also because we can make huge impact over there. Actually, sickle cell is the most common genetic disease in the world. And currently you have 300 million people globally carrying this gene in a way of, of form. What's more, we think sickle cell is a very quick way of prototyping our idea. Our idea. If you look at the current potential market for sickle cell and hemoglobin diseases, it's currently standing at close to $5.3 billion. But the economic potential of cover dx is actually way bigger than this because our tool in the future can be applied to diseases like malaria, Lyme disease, and blood cancers. As to our unique value proposition, cover dx is cheaper and it's easier to use. If you compare the current gold standard for sickle cell HB electrophoresis, it can take up to two days to get the results. Cover DX is bringing this down to less than a minute. And again, the current test can cost up to $63, which in America may not seem much, but when you live in a developing country where you live on less than a dollar a day, bringing the price down to less than $2 goes a long way. Again, because our test doesn't require extensive staining, it is easier to use and there is no steep learning curve. But these are not the only advantages we currently have. We are currently building a unique red cell membrane index, which will be able to tell not just how well the patient is doing, but also the efficacy of therapy, and also predict the likelihood of the patient having a sickle cell crisis. And so what this means is that, though the current tools provide just diagnostic information, we are providing both diagnostic and monitoring information. In terms of the business model, we are gonna provide, we are gonna make revenue from the sale of the cartridges, which Tim spoke about. It's a known fact that sickle cell disease patients in America visit the hospital on average about five times in a year. And so the goal is that with each visit, they're gonna go into the clinic with our test to tell how well they were doing. But we also plan to make revenues from the sale of the, the device itself. So I'll hand over back to Tim. Thanks, Yao. So Though we are still in the prototyping stage right now, Yao and I absolutely believe that we're the team for the job. We have the technical skills needed with me being a computer science PhD student here at Yale with experience in both machine learning and deep learning and Yao being an MD as well as a biomedical engineer. But we also have the entrepreneurship skills needed as well. Yao and I have been friends for over a year and have been working together the whole time. This is actually our second startup together and we know exactly what it takes to get it done. We have a great set of advisors that have been supporting us, encouraging us, helping us along the way from both the business side of things as well as from the science side. They have been just an immense resource for us as a team. As for our milestones, a couple months ago, we built our first prototype. We were accepted into the ABCT Accelerator, which is a biotech accelerator here in Connecticut. We received $30,000 from the Connecticut Innovation Fund, which we're using to build our second prototype, specifically using the money um, on acquiring that QPI patent. We plan to finish the second, second prototype by the summer of 2020, then use it to collect data, which we'll use to train our machine learning algorithms by fall of 2020. And then from there, we'll raise our seed round of funding to build the product and then go to market. As for our IP, we are just about to sign an exclusive patent option on the 3D QPI imaging system that was shown before. And we're also working to collect IP in a whole bunch of different areas as well including the proprietary cartridge, which we're designing, the red blood cell QPI image, which we'll be collecting, the AI algorithms, which we're designing to process this data, and the microscope improvements that we'll be building on top of the patent. So as for how we plan to use the Rothberg prize money, about $5,000 will, will be going to build the, the automated blood collection cartridge, the microfluidics one that I mentioned earlier, $8,000 going to the data collection, to train our AI algorithms and $2,000 going towards customer engagement and user experience design, making sure we're designing exactly the product that the customers wanna have. In summary, COVIDX is making the diagnosis and monitoring of sickle cell and other blood morphological diseases faster, cheaper, and easier to use by combining 3D phase imaging with deep learning. Thank you very much. Well done, COVIDX. All right, now on to the last round of questions for our judges. Sri, why don't you kick us off? What questions do you have for COVIDX? Yeah, so I, I saw that you have an existing patent that you're leveraging off. Is that, uh, are you having to license that exclusively and are you fi funding it through, pat through, 
through royalties or is it through some other mechanism? Yeah, you want to take this question? Sure. So we actually are receiving an exclusive patent option. And the, what the option means is that they are, they are also providing us with data and some time to play around with it to see if we actually want it. But they are giving us in the option the possibility of fully and exclusively licensing it. We haven't agreed yet the financing model for the patent, but from what we were told, some of the commonest model they use includes royalties. They also spoke about the possibility of receiving an exit um, payout. And also they also spoke about the possibility of um, getting equity in the company. So we are looking at a whole lot of options for this. And that uncertainty being there, option can be what the financial components would that be um how have you thought about the business model for the product the idea seems very sound but I'm, I'm curious you know will you be getting a global license will you be getting an exclusive us license like how are you thinking about this right now yeah uh or if we choose to convert or or um yeah Not to the like, kind of make good on the option then we'd get an exclusive license to the patent um, such that no one else could use it, and um, and and we'd be in communication with the the patent owners, which is Duke University, to discuss exactly how we want that um, the license payment to work, and that'd be you know a conversation that we have with them to decide what works best for both us and them. Got it. Um, and then the last question is: um, Has anybody else from Duke been doing sort of research or work on this patent? is likely to come up with a competing product. Um, so the, the original work was actually done by a professor who also published some research work on it, but he's actually on our advisory team. And so far he is very confident in actually handing it over to us to continue with it. So in terms of using this particular IP, we don't have any worries about like a competing company taking it away from us. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Wonderful, thanks. Uh, Alyssa, why don't you ask the next question? Oh, sure, great pitch and excellent idea in technology. Um, you mentioned that sickle cell is your first indication. Where do you see going next? We see it being used in malaria. Actually, um, the device has actually been used to um, collect data on malaria and it had a 99.9% .9 accuracy. Here in the US, it, it will be very useful for diagnosing Lyme disease, especially because we're in Connecticut, um, but also tick-borne infections carried by Borrelia. We also see it being very useful in leukemia and blood diseases. And even in the future, you could stretch, stretch it out to do complete blood count. Interesting, and what levels of specificity and sensitivity do you need for sickle cell? For sickle cell, okay, Tim, do you wanna take it? Uh, yeah, I can show you the slide. Okay, um, yeah, you wanna talk about this slide? Yes, so currently they actually use the device for sickle cell and they measured the thickness profiles over for normal cells. And then they also measured the thickness profiles for normal shaped cells for, sick, for sickle cell patients. And then they also did the same thing for actually sickled cells from sickle cell patients. And what they were able to determine that there were clear differences in the thickness profiles of all these cells and it compared favorably with current gold standard methods. So clearly it's very accurate and it can be used for this. Great, thank now you. We're, ta we're talking about upwards of 99 plus percent accuracy here. Excellent. Great, thank you so much. Sharon, would you like to take the last question of the day? Yeah, um, and I won't keep you guys for too long. So um, you talked about the first prototype that you built last year um, and then also going into launching the second version or second prototype for this summer. Um, what are the improvements that you guys are making? Um, one, and then two is part of that development um, based on what you guys outlined for um, use of funding. Is it is it just a design thing or is there improvements to specification or 
is it just the other pieces that you also want the patent in terms of like the cartridge um, and the other categories? You want to talk about this, yeah? Sure. Um, so the first prototype we actually built used a simple fluorescent microscope that requires staining and is difficult to use. What we are building now actually requires 3D face imaging, which is a way superior method of, Im of imaging. Um, so that's the first thing. We are also building cartridges, which we need the roadback price to be able to build. And that would also be totally different from what we build in the, in the summer. So it's a huge leap forward mm -hmm. in terms of improvement. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, COVID DX, and thank you to all the teams and judges for a wonderful pitch event. I'm going to ask the judges now to uh, escape to the deliberation room. I will see you there shortly. Audience, while the judges are deliberating, um, you'll soon see a poll, and we'd love for you to vote for your favorite idea. We'll announce the audience choice winner, as well as the grand prize winner in just a few moments after the judges have a chance to deliberate. So please stay tuned. All right, I'm gonna hand things off to Victor, our wonderful poll conductor. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Victor Padilla Taylor, and I am part of the Sci City team uh, that is supporting all these wonderful students. Uh, my role is director of mentors uh, and advisor and partner networks. And so uh, it's, it's been just a joy uh, to see you know, these collaborations happening uh, to promote these uh, teams. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to listen live to these four dedicated and committed teams that belong to our Yale uh, community. So if you also want to express your gratitude to these teams, please join me in providing immediate feedback uh, to these teams with your votes. So this is how uh, we're going to do it. We will be opening up a poll that will enable you to cast one vote per team uh, to the team of your choice, to the team that you want to express your support uh, this, this afternoon. Uh, the team that uh, you know, gets the most votes will of course receive today's audience uh, choice award, uh, which is $500. Uh, so this will be uh, today your act of support for these teams uh, uh, and your participation for this session. So are you ready? Here we go. Vote, vote away. If you remember, we have DM Health, a searchable platform aiding healthcare. Uh, patients in their customer journey. We also have Team Thermaband, empowering individuals to moderate their body temperature. We do have Team Control Trial, accelerating the patient screening process for clinical trials through AI. And we also have Team Cova DX, making the diagnosis of blood diseases quick and affordable. All right, let's, let's keep it going. We have more than a more than hundred uh, participants in this session and I only see a few votes being uh, cast at this moment. Show your support. We will have the poll open only three minutes. So please hurry up and vote quickly while we wait for our judges. I don't know, Abby, if you, if you see the same thing as I'm seeing, but I'm so excited. This is so close. Keep voting. Yep, it's pretty exciting, Victor. <clears throat> and we're creeping up at 83% of the audience has voted, but there's still 17% of the audience still to vote. Yes, your vote can make a difference. Um, it's close, it's close, but with your vote, we can make it even more representative.
Okay, we're over two minutes. We only have one more minute for you to cast your vote. Come on, those 20 people or so that are not casting your vote, you can make a difference here. And Victor, while you're plugging the poll, I am gonna plug the Startup Yale showcase that I said at the beginning of today's prize. So audience, please head over to startupyale.com now or after the Rothberg Prize has concluded to check out and support some of the other student entrepreneurs at Yale um, who all have specific asks um, in this interesting time of, a, of the COVID epidemic. All right. <laughs> And uh, we're also getting asked about bot farms possibly participating in the poll, but I'm afraid that uh, they're not allowed to vote. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, so time is up. We are ready to reveal the winner. Um, thank you so much for your participation. The poll is now closed. And Congratulations to. Are you going to tell us, Victor? Oh, well, we had agreed on that, but do you want to keep it in suspense? We can wait for that. I'll, I'll let you announce right that. now I if you want to. Otherwise, we can just make the whole, you know, we can make our, our finalists sweat until the very end. I totally agree with you. So we're gonna wait for that uh, moment. Uh, thank you so much. Congratulations to the winning team. We already have the name, but uh, you have to wait a little bit more to see the results. Uh, back to you, Abby. Okay, Cassie, give me the thumbs up. We good to go? All right, everybody else mute themselves. We're gonna hand it back to Cassie now. Great, thanks for everyone for staying tuned and enjoying the, the witty banter, which I'm sure Abby provided you. Um, the judges had a tough, tough deliberation. Um, and I just think that speaks so highly to all of you teams for your, your wonderful, fantastic ideas and the hard work that you put into producing such wonderful pitches. So, you know, applause to you. Well done. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty fantastic to watch. Um, I also want to take a moment before we do the big announcement to say thank you to our judges. Uh, your insights and questions throughout this entire review uh, process have been fantastic. The teams, uh, whether they take the, the prize home or not, will benefit from, from your insights. So thank you for that. Really, really appreciate it. And a, a shout out to my team, the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale, um, who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to make this, this virtual startup Yale happen. Uh, a big thank you to you. Um, it's fantastic. So without further ado, uh, I'd like Victor to reveal the poll results for the Audience Choice Award. Victor, congratulations Team Thermoband. You are this year's Audience Choice winner. Well done. <laughs> we decided this is the Zoom clap on our team. <laughs> All right, so um, without further ado, the 2020 grand prize winner for the Rothberg Catalyzer Prize is Control Trial. Congratulations, Control Trial. Well done. Uh, we truly, truly enjoyed your pitch and we think you have a fantastic idea. That concludes our competition today. Thanks again to the audience who, uh, who, who tuned in. Don't forget to check out the other fantastic prize competitions happening at Startup Yale. The next prize is later today at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. It's the New Haven Civic Innovation Prize. To check out uh, the Zoom link for that uh, prize competition, as well as the full schedule of prize competitions and our digital Yale Innovator Showcase, check out startupyale.com. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you. Everybody, unmute yourselves and give yourselves a big <laughs> round of applause. Great job, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you to our wonderful Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to organize this. Well done. Seriously, Thank you. well done. Thank you, organizer. Thank you, Cassie, Abigail, Bye. thank you so much. Right. Bye. Audience, I'll be ending this webinar. We'll see you all at 5.30 p.m., hopefully.